I'm taking YouTube viewers through my book, Authorized the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. We've hit chapter six, in which I answer 10 objections to my view. Except this is YouTube and I've got flexibility. I wanna answer just two more objections that I didn't feel I had space for in the first edition of Authorized. So let's make this answering 12 objections. Ready, go. Number one, why dumb down the Bible? Would you translate Shakespeare? When I first sat down to consider this objection, I actually felt that it was a bad idea to translate Shakespeare into contemporary English. Why? Because the whole point of reading Shakespeare, in my mind, was to eat your cultural vegetables. Eat what your mother tongue serves you or so help me. But then I got to thinking with some help from my favorite linguist, John McWhorter, what is it that makes Shakespeare difficult? McWhorter says that most people assume it's three things, poetry, density, and elevation, but it's not. It's dead words and false friends. McWhorter recommends the work of a guy who actually lives in my area of the country, a guy who isn't a professor, but who has used his off time to make what he calls 10% translations of Shakespeare. Translations in which he leaves the poetry, density, and elevation, but quietly updates the dead words and false friends. Can you tell which of these two options is Shakespeare and which is the 10% translation? Option A. Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office. Option B. Duncan hath borne authority so meekly, hath been so pure in his great office. Faculties doesn't mean now what it meant in 1606 when Macbeth was first performed. In other words, option A was 1606, option B is the 10% translation. Now we would use the word authority instead of faculties. Even the simple word clear didn't mean in 1606 what it means in a context like that today. We would use the word pure. The result of a 10% translation still clearly sounds like Shakespeare. And I think it's what Shakespeare would want. Who writes a play desiring to be misunderstood at random moments because of language change? And who translates a Bible desiring the same thing? With the King James Version and with Shakespeare, it all comes down to what you value. Do you value tradition, having the same cultural experience that everyone else has had? Or do you value understanding? Now the answer is that you value both if you possibly can. That's why I began authorized by talking carefully through the things of value that we will lose if we let the King James Version cease to be our common standard English Bible. But what about when these two values come into conflict, tradition versus understanding? Evangelical Protestants like me have an answer, a definite one. Understanding ought to weigh more. It is more important. If it weren't, we'd still be using the Latin Vulgate. Edification requires intelligibility. Number two, the King James Version sounds like the Word of God. The modern versions are just so quotidian, so pedestrian, so banal. I will be the four millionth to admit that King James English is beautiful English. It sounds like the Bible to me too. I grew up with it. But I've had to stop and ask myself, biblically speaking, what should the Bible sound like? We are probably in agreement that it should not sound like the hoodlums loitering outside a gas station near you. Mm, uh, should it sound like elegant Charlestonians, you know, a refined Southern accent? No, that would be weird too. How about Canadians? They're nice. Uh, should it sound like them? No, sorry. I'm not about to let that happen, eh? Oh, here's one. Should it sound like turn of the 17th century, well-educated British people from the upper classes? Every variety of English, in other words, comes from a time, a place, and a people. Yes, we do associate Elizabethan English with the sacred, not just religiously, but even culturally, as in Shakespeare. But there's nothing necessary about this. Is God incapable of speaking contemporary English, our English? Sociolinguistics has taught us that there are always up and down versions of a language of any size. There are dialects with cachet and dialects that people look down on. Neurosurgeons very rarely talk like Mater from the movie Cars, for example. It's understandable that people feel that the Bible, sacred language, belongs in a high and exalted dialect of English. But God had a chance to choose grandiose, grandiloquent language when he inspired the Bible, and he didn't. He chose common Greek for the New Testament. The very name we give it today, koine, means common. Biblically speaking, then, we should use commonly accessible English when we translate. 
and I think we can use respectful English that is still accessible. It's the kind of English that you hear on the nightly news. Our Bible translations should sound like us, or maybe like the best version of us, what we sound like when we dress up a little for a formal event. Our English, our English is capable of this. Number three, didn't the King James translators choose timeless language on purpose, and should we perhaps accede to their wisdom? My simple answer is no. <laughs> There's no such thing as timeless language. Every piece of language of any length can be dated to a time and located to a place. The King James translators used an English that was slightly older than the one they spoke because their job was to revise the 1568 Bishop's Bible, which was itself a revision ultimately of Tyndall's work from the 1520s and 30s. The English of the KJV has a history, and the English of the KJV won't last forever. Even in the 1700s, there were people complaining that its English was no longer fully understandable. One of those people was Ben Franklin, I kiddeth not. Here's what he said. The language is much changed since 1611, and the style being obsolete and thence less agreeable is perhaps one reason why the reading of that excellent book is of late so much neglected. And here's Noah Webster of the 1828 Webster Dictionary, who said something similar a few years later. In fact, he actually mentions dead words and false friends. Listen. Some words in the King James Version have fallen into disuse, and the signification of others in current popular use is not the same now as it was when they were introduced into the version. The effect of these changes is that some words are not understood by common readers who have no access to commentaries, and who will always compose a great proportion of readers, while other words being now used in a sense different from that which they had when the translation was made present a wrong signification or false ideas. The King James Version is not timeless English. Nobody can write timeless English. There's no such thing. Number four, doesn't the King James preserve the important distinction between singular thee, thou, thy, and plural ye, you, your, second person pronouns? Now, yes, this is absolutely true, and this is a genuine loss for modern English Bible translations. But all translations require compromise. You just cannot bring every last piece of information from Hebrew and Greek over into any version of English or Urdu or Japanese or Russian or Botswana or whatever they speak in Botswana, I don't know. Take grammatical gender, for example. An oath in Greek is masculine, horkos. Oath in Hebrew is feminine, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. English used to have gender too many, many centuries ago. In fact, oath was masculine in it. But English lost grammatical gender long before 1611, and it doesn't have it now. There is literally no way to bring gender information for nouns, that is grammatical gender, from the original languages into English. And it's okay. We more than make do. We can still understand. Also, Greek distinguishes between singular and plural relative pronouns, like the word who. King James English and Modern English do not, even though it makes a difference in the interpretation of a verse such as 2 Timothy 3.14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Is whom singular or plural there? English doesn't tell you. It can't. Only a footnote can, and nobody ever complains. How often is it significant that singular and plural you be distinguished? A Bible translation friend says his organization has a list of 14 places in the whole Bible where it matters. For languages they encounter, like English, that don't distinguish singular and plural you, they add a footnote. I think that's a great solution for modern English too. So this is a loss, yes, but it's a loss I'll take in order to get rid of dead words and false friends, and to put the English Bible into language accessible to the plowboy. Number five. Sure, the English language has changed. It has gotten worse. Why give in to the debasement of our mother tongue by translating the Bible into modern idioms? And I just want to say, who says? I already mentioned C.S. Lewis earlier. That's enough for a case closed. And contemporary English has many, many great writers. I have no desire to deny that the King James Version and Shakespeare were at the height of the English of their time. But Elizabethan English had bad writers too, just like we do. We just don't know about them, because why would we? All we know is the King James Version and Shakespeare, pretty much, and compared to them, the last email you got from someone probably isn't as good, sure. But how is it even possible to say that one English is better than another? And even if Elizabethan English is better than our English, what matters more? Maintaining the superiority of the word chambering over the word immorality? Or 
giving the plowboy a Bible he can understand. Given the dead words and false friends the King James now contains because of language change, I'm arguing that we cannot fully understand it anymore. We can largely understand it, sure, and so can the plowboy, and I'm, I'm very glad for that. But largely isn't good enough for me when it's the Bible we're talking about. I want to understand everything I possibly can when I read God's word. Edification requires intelligibility. Let me say again, I am not suggesting that we dumb down the Bible. I am suggesting that we remove unnecessary barriers to understanding. Barriers introduced not by lowering educational standards or the increase of sugar intake by America's children, but by barriers introduced by language change, dead words, and false friends. Some parts of the Bible will always be hard to understand. Peter said so. And they should remain that way. Modern Westerners will never know what mandrakes are unless they look the word up. Paul's intricate and impassioned logic in the book of Romans will always be an enriching challenge, and it should remain so. But language change introduces unnecessary difficulties for modern readers. It is not dumbing down the Bible to change besom into broom, or let into restrain. Broom is not dumber than besom. Tumor is not dumber than emerald. Our English is not dumber than Elizabethan English. It's just different. We have brilliant writers and so did they. Have you ever read C.S. Lewis? You cannot tell me that his English is dumbed down. And if his English has some kind of disease, will somebody please infect my English with whatever disease C.S. Lewis's English had? Number six, today's Bible translations drop the important practice of including italics in the text for indicating words supplied by the translators. Aren't they being somewhat dishonest, therefore, compared to the King James? Italics are indeed useful, but mainly for people who can read some Greek and Hebrew. Here's what I mean. Take the only example I can think of that I've heard numerous people mention in which italics are supposed to help people understand the Bible better. Psalm 14, 1. Have you heard this one? The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Yes, it's true. The words there and is were supplied by the translators. They aren't in the Hebrew. So my clever roommate in college told us in a room devotional one night that what the verse really means is, the fool hath said in his heart, no God. But there's a problem. That's not what the Hebrew says. That word no in Hebrew means specifically non-existence of. It doesn't mean no, as in what two-year-olds say when their mom tells them to eat their peas. There is nothing wrong with what the King James translators did here, but italics don't help you understand the verse unless you can read Hebrew. Now, I can read Hebrew, but it's a challenge. Greek is easier for me. This very day, right before I recorded this, I was studying Proverbs, and I checked the Hebrew in Proverbs 24, 23 to see whether the sayings of the wise there are called something specific, or is it just generic? Is it words, or is it things? I was pretty sure that the Hebrew text did not include either one, but I checked the italics in the King James just to make sure. And indeed, those italics in the King James helped me be certain of what I saw in the Hebrew because they italicized the word things. This is all a little hard to explain if you don't know Hebrew, a language which just doesn't work like English does. But this I'm certain everybody out there can understand. Try reading a page of the King James Version without the italicized words. It won't make good sense. The King James translators supply those words because they are pretty well demanded by the context. That's just the way translation works. The italics aren't strictly necessary. Notice also that in modern English, italics mean emphasis. Most readers of the Bible, I think, understand what they mean in the King James or the NASB, which also uses italics, but it's just one more bump in the readability road for the uninitiated, and, and it really isn't a whole lot of help. Italics have pros and cons. I think it's good for some editions of the Bible to have them, mainly as a help for those learning Hebrew and Greek, but they don't really aid understanding for anyone else. Number seven, the King James Version is easier to memorize than modern versions. I've heard this one many, many times. Well, the King James surely was easier for me to memorize because I was very young when I started to read it and very young during the whole period in which I read it exclusively. I don't think the King James is any easier to memorize in itself. It just happens to be what a lot of us grew up on. What we're commenting on is how much easier it is to memorize anything when we're young rather than old and decrepit and senile like we are now. Sometimes people also complain that scripture memorization is harmed by the use of multiple Bible translations in a church. Now, I think this is true, so I think it's good for churches to pick one Bible translation to use. And I think picking one modern translation and sticking with it will solve any memorization problems. Number eight, the King James Version is a faithful literal translation. Other versions are more like paraphrases. 
The KJV is surely a literal translation, the technical term is formal. That is, it tends as much as possible to stick with the forms of Hebrew and Greek, especially word choice and word order. But multiple modern translations are also literal. The New King James Version, the English Standard Version, and especially the New American Standard Bible. And if you've never used a less formal translation in your Bible study, you're really missing out. I urge every English-speaking Christian to regularly read and check the New International Version. Where I grew up, to say this was like recommending that you wash your hands in radioactive mud. But finally, a teacher of mine in college persuaded me to just try it, and I've been doing it for 20 years now. And guess what? Over and over and over and over again, reading the NIV and other more dynamic or functional translations, like the New Living Translation, for example, has helped me understand little statements of the Bible I didn't realize I wasn't quite getting. For years, I read and even memorized Psalm 16.6 in the King James, and I didn't realize I was not understanding it. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly heritage. It is not the King James translator's fault that I never realized what lines David was talking about. Their translation is perfectly literal, perfectly accurate. We would say inheritance today, not heritage, but that's not a huge deal. Nonetheless, I didn't get this verse. I asked a friend once. He thought the lines were genealogical lines, like family trees. Then one morning I read it in the NIV, and it suddenly clicked. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. That solved it for me. David was talking about lines around a lot of land. Yes, in a sense, the NIV added a word that isn't in the Hebrew, the word boundary, but the NIV translators sensed that that's what it would take for readers to understand what David was talking about. I just cannot get angry when someone helps me understand God's words. Often throughout my life, a less strictly literal translation has helped me understand what God says. Number nine, the modern versions are based on corrupt Greek and Hebrew texts. My work in Authorized is neutral on this question. Whether you prefer the Textus Receptus or not, or even whether or not you have any idea what that is, you should be able to agree with the case in my book. My case is about English, not Hebrew or Greek. The New King James Version and the Modern English Version are based on the very same original language texts as the King James, and they use contemporary English. You can have your TR and read it too. Number 10. The Modern Versions are copyrighted. They exist only for the money. The laborer is worthy of his hire. If someone pays money for translators to have sandwiches and meetings and Bible software and pays for editors and typographers and typefaces and paper and gilding and those nylon ribbons that always get frayed unless you melt them with a match first and leather and ink and printing and shipping, the Bible does not require them to do it all for free. <laughs> Copyright protects them from having their work stolen by an unscrupulous foreign publisher. Now that would be greedy, but it is not greedy to charge money for Bibles. I won't deny that there are some hokey study Bibles out there that smell suspiciously like consumerism to me. I don't know the personal motivations of every last person involved in producing modern translations, but neither does the internet. And claiming that your Christian brothers and sisters at Crossway and Brobman and Holman and Thomas Nelson are making Bibles because of greed is a very serious charge. I'd like to see some direct evidence. How much profit are they making? I asked the best friend I have among living English Bible translators, a godly older teacher and scholar who has memorized more Bible passages than you or I will ever manage, what kind of car do you drive? What kind of house do you live in? Have you been made rich by your work on the English Standard Version? As of my last checking with him, he drives a 2004 Honda Odyssey with over 180,000 miles on it, and he lives in the same house he and his wife have lived in for their entire married life, a house they bought for $65,000. He did point out to me that, in all honesty, it's worth more now because of inflation. Countless other Christians who work on the other major modern English Bible versions are not perfect, but they are Christians who care deeply about the church. I don't like hearing their reputations attacked. Number 11. You are pushing modern version onlyism, only not King Jamesism. Let the Bible speak, brothers and sisters. God said through the pen of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 that edification requires intelligibility. I do not care when a translation was produced. I care whether it meets that scriptural standard. In countless places, in fact in the vast majority of the entire King James, the King James does meet that standard. 
but it also contains hundreds of dead words and at least dozens of false friends that I've documented. Good and loving Christians will differ over when this tally of dead words and false friends has become great enough that it's time to revise or replace the King James. I, I think we're there. Others for whom I have genuine respect think that we're not. But so far, to bring up my small cadre of critics again, none of the people who've dismissed my case about readability have explained how it is that the plowboy is supposed to look up false friends, words he doesn't even realize he's misunderstanding. I don't personally think there is an answer to this argument that I'm making. Now, it, it's not an attack on Wycliffe's Bible. It's not anti-Wycliffe discrimination to say that it's not really suited for current use. We clearly don't speak that English. The difference between King James English and our English isn't as great as the difference between Wycliffe and our English. I, I readily acknowledge this, but I think the difference is great enough to cause serious concern. I don't think a church's only or main Bible translation should be the King James Version, because I do not think we should be using unintelligible words in church. I'm not telling anyone to throw their King James away. I certainly haven't. I use it every day. It's kind of hard not to when I've memorized so many King James verses. But I'm saying that no one should be insisting that anyone else use the King James Version exclusively. Not when it contains dead words and especially false friends. That would be placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. No one I know of has fully memorized all the hundreds of obscure dead words in the King James Version. Chode, kukau, nop with a K, niesings, moraine, etc., etc., etc. And no one I know of can spot all the false friends either. When the main response I have received to my false friend's argument is, let's change the subject to Greek New Testament textual criticism, that makes me think I'm onto something. I simply have heard no real response to the question, how are people supposed to look up words they don't even realize they're misunderstanding? Number 12. And finally, methinks thou dost protest too much. The problem isn't really that bad. You make it sound like the whole King James is unreadable, but I just read it this morning and it doesn't feel that way to me. In my mind, this is the most weighty objection to my whole project in Authorized. This is the debate I'm trying to have with my brothers and sisters in the King James Only movement. How many dead words and false friends are required before we all agree that the King James Version needs to be revised or replaced? One dead word is not enough. 10,000 probably is enough. Are we agreed on those two poles? So we're somewhere in between those two numbers. So, so where do we draw the line? I don't know. This calls for spirit-filled wisdom. Countless thousands of godly conservative Christians have come to feel, as I have, that the readability problems posed by Elizabethan English are too great, and a bridge we just don't need to cross, considering how many good translations we have in contemporary English. For me, it was years of evangelism that most helped me to see how deep these readability problems are. I would talk to non-Christian plowboys and plowgirls of all stripes, and they just really stumbled over King James English. It wasn't until much later, until I started reading other translations, that I realized that I myself was stumbling more often than I knew. And that ends up being my advice to anyone who loves the King James Version as I do and, and thinks my concerns about King James readability are overblown. Just read another translation if you never have. Just try it. Tell me it doesn't help you understand. Read through the whole English Standard Version. Read the whole NIV. Read the Christian Standard Bible. Read the New King James Version. Just try it. <laughs> I have found over 20 plus years that checking multiple Bible translations is an essential part of my Bible study. They help me understand what God said. Don't pit readability against accuracy. An accurate Bible that isn't readable isn't really accurate because it didn't get God's words into your language. We need both of those things. I find people sometimes don't believe me when I say I love the King James. It's all or nothing with them. I have to think the King James is 100% ideal or they think I hate it. But I will not accept that false dichotomy. I can love the King James Version very deeply. I can have hundreds of its verses and thousands of its phrases hidden in my heart. And I can still think that the dead words and false friends are a sufficient problem, sufficient enough to cause real concern. Edification requires intelligibility. I don't just love the King James Version, I love the plowboy for whom it was made. I want him to eat good spiritual food that he can actually chew.